Well, here we are for another Inner Sanctum. Indeed. And this week I have my tea and my special <laughs> cat mom. Cat mom. I thought I should just bring it out right, yeah, right well, up front. Because I left cat dad. You should have told me. I thought it was obvious when I brought the okay. tea here. I, I mean, didn't, I wasn't paying attention. You can have some. Well, thank you. But you are not the cat mom. So if you want to be. No, I'm, I'm the cat dad. Roles. You, you're the one who's really uh the enforcer yeah, right? the disciplinarian yeah no we, we do we do uh really fall into standard uh gender roles when it comes to to our animals the managing yes. of our, our two cats yeah well they need a mommy and a daddy <laughs> no they, they can have whatever they want and they're, honestly they're super independent yeah they're I our mean, animal companions yeah psyche is extremely independent very feral I mean, independent as far as cats can be. Like, she can't feed herself. She can't. She can't really do anything by she herself. Tries. But she <laughs> likes to assert that she doesn't need us, and then say, "Now feed me." Where Hermes is like a little Velcro cat. Anywhere you are, he's like right, right in your lap, right up your butt. Uh, yeah, he's he's adorable, and um, he's sleeping right now. So let's hope that he continues to yeah to nap. Um, well. Today we had like a free-flowing kind of conversation idea because the last few Fromage Mystiques have been pretty heavy. And by Fromage Mystiques, I mean Inner Sanctums. Fromage Mystique is our Substack newsletter where this will be distributed, yes. but Inner Sanctum is hosted on YouTube. <laughs> and I'm telling you as if you don't know this. Well, it's good, uh, to, good to remember. Yes. Um, the last few have been heavier or denser and this one will probably be dense too but we wanted to re-establish that yeah this is inner sanctum time this is time to chill with us and to just discuss things we're interested in so with that in yeah. mind in our very first inner sanctum we did book recommendations and one of the books that we recommended was greening the paranormal correct and i would love to start there because you were just telling me about something really interesting you were reading yeah, well, you asked me what I was doing, like, magically. And, like, to some degree, you know, because we, love we live in the same space. Together. We talk about things we're interested mm -hmm. in during the week. We love each other. We do, which contributes this whole feedback thing. Yeah. Um, but Our clever bants. <laughs> Our clever bants. We got the banter. Oh, the banter. That's the secret to podcasting success, is do you have banter? Can you do bants? <laughs> <laughs> literally never heard that before <laughs> like phrased that way yeah that's fantastic um getting back to mm -hmm. getting back to the so you asked me what's what are you doing yeah uh recently and what are you interested in and I I told you I just read an essay mm -hmm. in greeting the paranormal about interoception and the ability to uh, know what your body is doing what your body is need needs for example like realizing that you're hungry that's your body like telling you is that interoception like i am hungry now i have intercepted or is interoception like something different than that like what is the interoception what is that actually i think it's um like bodily sensations and interpreting that like okay. in basically the interpretation of right your body or uh, the sense of your body in like a certain place. Bodies and spaces, right? Okay. Right. So, so you're like, I understand that I'm sitting in a chair right now. Gotcha. Um, so it's not somatics. It's not like I am having a fear response and my body is like shaking and I am perspiring. Well, I actually am not sure the difference between interoception and somatics as like a, a discipline. Yeah. Um, They certainly relate to each other. I don't know enough about somatics to really make qualified opinions yeah. around it so i won't <laughs> my impression and i could be dead wrong okay my impression is that somatics as a term or as like a popular kind of cochosphere new age thing mm -hmm. is similar in many ways to um human design hmm. and like that human design is like a 21st century kind of updated version of like your basic astrology and i know yes. i know there are human design people listening who are like dan you are wrong that is incorrect you idiot i get it i i can only hold so much brain in my noodle <laughs> and so holding that much brain is um 
what? taken up by other things astrology grimoires etc <laughs> i don't understand this newfangled dialogue um well yeah you and i have not been as interested in human design so i cannot compare it to somatics because i don't know much about you right but yeah, i see people same thing, yeah people who like, talk yeah. about this also talk about this like where you have like astrology people talking about planetary magic human design people talk about somatics mm -hmm. but intero I've not seen the relationship okay um i definitely believe it's there it's anecdotal but like somatics uh is like about knowledge of one's body knowledge of one body as self okay and the integration between like you and your body which mm -hmm. is integrated but uh, there is a disconnection in like a global or Western culture, yeah. uh, globally speaking. There's and a disconnection between self, yes, <laughs> uh, understanding of self and one's body and the communication that happens all the time between uh, mind and body. And that's where we get into the interpretation of the sensations mm. because um, you know the relationship between like anxiety and fear and excitement. Yeah. So sometimes like when you're walking into a situation where you have to do something that might cause anxiety, such as public speaking, mm -hmm. uh, a reframe is I'm so excited rather yeah. than I'm so anxious. You're right. doing the same thing. Your body might be trembling. Uh, your heartbeat might be elevated. But if you kind of reframe, I'm so excited, it can help you get mm -hmm. through it. So there is an interpretation piece there. Yeah. Yeah, there is. I think that's that's really interesting to me because I know nothing about the um, essay that you were talking about that yes, you read. You did not read it. However, did I have been it. playing around with uh, AI chatbots lately. And like the yeah, idea yeah, of but... AI, because I I think AI is a failed project and that's something that we can, you know, sidebar for another time. My kind of predictive gut instinct is that AI can never deliver on the promise that's being sold right now. Mm -hmm. It can do certain things very well, but the idea of machine learning is not that the machines are getting smarter, which is what we think of when we think of machine learning. They're just getting faster at formulating responses that seem human um mm -hmm. my feeling though of talking talking working with like ai asking it for images or using like chat gpt to like you know what tell is me that? about exactly so it's a form uh it's a specific it's almost like a brand again i'm not very good with technology as far as like the computer science behind this. I've only read what I've read and like some articles about it. I'm not okay. a computer scientist, but the like AI chatbots, chat, whatever I just said, it's a, um, it's like a- well, What do you do with it? Oh, you just Basically. put in like, so you can talk to it. Some of them you can be like, hey, how are you doing today? Talk to it. Because the idea is that the more we interface with it, the more information it gets about the human condition, I don't and the want more pro I don't want productive it becomes. Well, that's the interesting thing is that from my experience with them, mm -hmm. either having them draft long form content or create imagery or mm -hmm. engage in like talking, which was something that dates all the way back to when you and I were in college. Do you remember I used to like yes. screw around with that chat bot? Yeah. yeah. My professor recommended like... Is yes. that how you got to it? Yes, it was super, it was super rudimentary too. Yeah. But what I've noted is that when you try and talk with something like this around the mind, body, or spirit connection component, the language is simply non-existent for those um those those um AIs to articulate what's happening with them on a self level. Like you quickly see the limitations okay. of it trying to describe itself. So like AI is super useful for saying, you say, hey, write me an essay about Druidry. It'll write a decent essay about Druidry that you need to like heavily proofread. However, if you ask it to like create a Druid ritual, it doesn't know what to do. And it will just kind of like maybe spit out a rhyme that says like druids druids they're so fun druids druids there are none or something like that very like you quickly see the identity the self component just fall off so a cliff weird. yeah uh, okay well i mean that makes 
sense. Yeah, because it doesn't really have identity or self, but yeah. it struggles to articulate it, I think, from a spiritual component because of like the existence of a consciousness or soul. It doesn't have that. Yeah. Um, but from a programmer perspective, I think because Western culture has such a hard time explaining the mind-body divide or explaining the soul or like what is human about humans, mm -hmm. that is encoded into the structure of the programs. I see. So like computer so engineers might ignore their beliefs and limitations. Yeah. Uh, track down to the computer. Right. Which is really like concerning machine learning yeah it's concerning when we think about like okay these things are you know doing they're they're doing like customer service or they're sure. creating creating art is the kind of thing that they say they do now like um the one that we used to generate images uh lensa mm -hmm. it was very popular on social media for like a hot second yeah and that kind of art component, as you look at them, you're able to tell that they're that they're AI. There is yeah. something lacking from them, not just that the hands are disfigured. The hands were weird. The necklaces were weird. Mm -hmm. And in yours, your necklaces became like your boots. Exactly. Well, they did. <laughs> that, well, I was wearing this necklace. Yes. For one of them, and that was but they like put it up mm -hmm. with the chain going down. Yeah. I don't know, but um, I did notice. To, to follow along with what we're talking about, I did notice that um, it did not like to give me brown eyes. Right. Even though all my photos, and, and I obviously have brown eyes, it, um, it didn't like that. It preferred to give me uh, beautiful green or blue eyes. Yeah, there's and there's something like encoded into that, which is like, what does that say? Is that the it's preferential? A, it's a standard of beauty. Yeah. It's like... You know, it also gave me. <laughs> isn't that a larger, uh, a larger bosom? Yes, isn't that person. isn't that also though? Like, you can read that as like nefarious intent on the side of programmers as like some kind of eugenics mm -hmm. program. But I don't think that's a responsible read. Well, no, it's not that. It's just that social standards of beauty. So if you type in make me an image of a beautiful woman what it's going to do is search through and pull out all the like you know google images that are mm -hmm. listed as beautiful woman now if right. it were using bing there would be like a toaster in there right <laughs> but because it's using google it's all the things that have kind of risen to the top okay and not necessarily in like a meritocratic way if there is such a thing of like ranking beauty right. or ranking we didn't all like no. democratically vote but then that affects that us. This photo is the be most beautiful. Yeah, and we can sure. we can accidentally end up reinforcing that. Like you see yeah. that in um, it was a big controversy when we were younger. Um, when we were in college in Japan, there was conversations around people getting like unnecessary cosmetic surgery as children to look more like um this idealized and impossible beauty standard that was informed mm -hmm. in that specific subculture informed by video games informed by uh like artistic renderings well that must still happen i'm sure it does right. and like it's not fair to point the finger and say like oh well this is just unique to japan like oh no. i mean the buccal fat removal if i'm saying that right is like yeah. the western example of that like everyone just suddenly looks like they're 90 years old and that's right that's the hollywood trend and if you don't know what that is don't good Google for you it. just don't just good leave it you. Hopefully it's a, a, you know, a trend of bad type of thing. No. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Yes. Um, but I was thinking we've seen many, many studies, I think from since we started paying attention for the last 10 years mm -hmm. of prejudice being passed down into programming yeah. for computers. So it's not just beauty standards, but other no. prejudices and beliefs honestly and, people's um, mentality and beliefs and how they see and define the world mm -hmm. in because it kind of has to be translated into black and white yeah into you know binary mm -hmm. into uh, one or the other uh, this is encoded into the programming mm -hmm. that we use and this is not just machine learning or ai this no. is structure but that I think people collectively create and use together. Yes. 
I think what's cool about AI and the way it's emerged right now from like a metaphysical perspective, like I, I, I really want to be clear here that I don't think AI is some kind of like nightmare end time scenario we need to worry about. Like no. Terminator is not happening. I enjoy the horror movies. About yes. It. Terminator though, isn't happening. And there's a narrative right now that is really being pushed out of like bigger tech firms and stuff about like this idea of, um, altruistic futurism of you need to give, you know, Sam Bankman fried or Elon Musk or Mark Zuckerberg, all your money. We can't tax them. We can't take any of that. We need to give it all. We need to give them all their money of all of it so that they can prevent Terminator from happening. And that is like this kind of, uh, there's this kind of hubris and conceit there that just doesn't make a lot of sense under scrutiny. To be clear, I don't think that AI is like ushering in an apocalypse. Yeah, and I, neither is there like a GoFundMe to no, support the, no. the um what the savings fund for yeah. if a Terminator event happens. I don't right. Terminator was the guy who saved them though. In the second one. In the first one, he sent back the oh, kill. Right. And then he's it's a it's a big twist that's spoiled in the trailer. Like if that would have been released Uh-oh. in the 80s and people would have opened up the yeah, camera, it like... people would have been like, I'm going into the movie and I'm watching this and oh my God, Arnold Schwarzenegger, he's the good guy this time. That would have been, and it's presented as a twist in the film, uh-huh. but it's literally like in those 80s cheese ball trailers where they're like, in a world where Arnold Schwarzenegger is the good guy now, like bad, regardless. Wow. How do you? <laughs> How do you know you were even alive in the 80s? Like, how do you know this? These things they ended up on TV, you know. We watch them, cultural osmosis, and then we end up where we are now. Regardless. Okay. okay. I'm not saying no that. What I am saying is that AI is kind of stupid. It's interesting and it has useful applications, but to me, as like a metaphysically minded person, someone who loves magic and is interested more than ever in this idea of consciousness exploration. Psychonaut. Reading <laughs> Lieber, uh, Lieber Null and Psychonaut by Peter Carroll has me like thinking about all of this. The thing that's been most interesting has been the highlighted fact that when we compare ourselves to machines in like old pop culture, it was always like, oh, you know, machines don't have a soul. They, they're not human. But there was a difficult, there was difficulty in explaining why. Like, why is the automaton not human? And Frank Herbert in Dune tries to explain this and then just ends up kind of hand-waving it where he's like, oh, you know, humans got lazy and so we outlawed machines. There are many machines on it. (laughs) Strange machines. Um, However, in talking with AI chatbots, what I've realized is that they really have zero awareness of the self or of the soul. They can talk about the self, but like I said, the language around the self is totally aberrant to the way we talk about the self. And so there is no, whether you wanna call it somatic or whether you wanna call it like physical awareness or grounding, that is entirely absent. And it's made me a big fan of the pendulum as like a way to communicate with the body because it's not just the soul. Like the soul is not the, just the locus of what makes us human. The body is too. And that's what I'm kind of uncovering with my pendulum research and. Uh, with the AI thing. I'm curious to see if that ties into what you're talking about. So tell me everything about, what was the word? Inter- Interception. Interception. Inception. I, I basically told you everything. Okay. I know. Because it was just one essay. <laughs> sure. And it was also about other topics. But um, she was speaking to something that is near and dear to my heart, which is the um, ascertaining knowledge through things that are not your brain or Mm -hmm. through reading, but through experiencing things in your body Mm -hmm. and basically continuing to strengthen that dialogue between that kind of conscious awareness and bodily sensation and the knowledge that arises from that dialogue Mm -hmm. so that to me is very interesting yeah and I'm trying to think about you like connecting with the pendulum you are externalizing you're externalizing 
the tool so that you can see it on the conscious mind. Ah. But what I've been loving lately is this idea, and I forget where I read it, but this okay. idea that the body is in many ways the way in which we access the subconscious. And I really liked that really? because this idea of the subconscious has been so mercurial, so difficult to pin down. People are like, we can only access it through dreams or like we need to contact the higher guardian angel or the holy daemon. And like, those are all useful and effective. But I really love the idea that the body has access to the subconscious mind. And to me, it's a perfect wedding with the pendulum because the pendulum works in like two modes. The pendulum works really well for spirit communication, but a lot of like professional skeptics or debunkers dismiss the pendulum and they'll say like, oh, it's not spirit communication. It's just the ideomotor response. It's just, it's just the body moving. And I love that because when you are mm -hmm. tapped in what to the, the ideomotor response, what is the body moving? Like when I communicate with the body, mm -hmm with my body, with me, yeah, with the pendulum, it is a different feeling and it moves differently and it has different answers than when I ask a spirit to communicate through a pendulum. Mm. And that's like trial and error stuff that we've talked about in like our past mediumship work. But I'm really loving this idea about the body is more than a meat suit. It's more than just your like meat mech that takes you from room to room. Yeah. And it's, it is you like it, we are the body more, yes and it's more than something that needs to be managed mm -hmm. or maintained mm. or just gets attention when something's in pain right it it's um it is not an it <laughs> it's not an it the body is uh, it's you. divine mm -hmm. and it are keepers of knowledge and they are conveying that knowledge to us all the time. Yeah. And this person writing the essay happened to write, like, I don't really need right now to, you know, seek knowledge in a certain way because I am so busy, like, reflecting on the knowledge that is within me mm -hmm. that needs to be witnessed in me. Yeah. And I think that's lovely. It is lovely. I mean... So how do we do that? I think... One of the ways is tearing down this like ridiculous mind body divide that is either that's too polar, in my opinion. Like, we either have like the hardcore rational, rationalist, materialist model of we don't understand consciousness and the body is all that is, or you have like the kind of opposite end reaction to that in like new age communities of. The spirit is all that matters. And you see this in religion too. The spirit is all that matters. The body is just a vessel and it's, you know, maybe a, a problem that needs to be overcome. We yeah. talked about that with like ascetic movements. That's more classic too. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very... It's platonic, right? Um, Neoplatonic. Yeah. Because platonic, that's what I was saying. Like I've got to say that it's not a nuanced read no. of these things because... Well, I'm not going to discuss. <laughs> We're coming out against Neoplatonism today. <laughs> oh, well, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, there, there's, there's more nuance there. Yeah, yeah. Um, in this philosophy uh, that I think from a Western mindset, we have interpreted it to mean uh, the body, the mind is needing to be elevated out of this body, which is the, the container by which we suffer basically mm -hmm. yeah um and that we need eventually to get out of mm -hmm. and i think that that's the eleusinian read on it yeah but that's a very unnuanced read that i believe is where somatics comes in that movement is now shifting mm -hmm. away from that hard divide yes and we are trying now getting to integrate more into our bodies and consider that as a spiritual development as higher development well it well. explains so much like yoga yoga is foundational to western magic since essentially crowley and i never make that connection yeah i really don't I but you said he he like he really it he practiced yoga advocated he it. advocated for it he would have actually a lot of like historians believe he actually probably could have had a very very wealthy career as like a 
yoga instructor. And he never seems like he does yoga, like from the photo. No, if you look at the guy, you're like, this guy does yoga. He eats like fondue for breakfast. That's what it looks like to me. But you can eat fondue for breakfast yeah, and do yoga. I shouldn't. I shouldn't throw shade either. No, and the emphasis on yoga is different. He practiced Raja yoga, which is not like you the you know as well as I do, but let's just say for the audience, what? Western yoga is a healthcare routine. Like that's about all that it is. Down it's dog. Down dog, get fit, get a nice butt, get good thighs, get tight abs. That's yoga. That's in how the into yoga. Yeah, and that's there's nothing wrong with that. However, yoga has like multiple then other was, branches then there was more and multiple other pieces to explore yeah. some of it doesn't have anything to do with the body some of it is pure meditation impossible i know is right? that true yeah yeah i think it's lies <laughs> that doesn't sound right to me i know i was blown away we have raja yoga over on the shelves yep right up there above the dream dictionary uh fully oh recommend Crowley, Crowley recommends it in book four which is his um exploration and essentially his like intro teaching guide to how to do magic okay but yoga makes a lot more sense interesting for magical development when we think about the body as more than the meat suit like it's not even just about connecting to the body which has become like, like the new refrain around why we do yoga and magic it's to connect with the body it's to help energy move and that's true and that happens yeah but it's also literally the movement of like it is spiritual health for the body like it is the spiritual food that helps the body do what it must do mm. i feel like there's something it's something that i struggle to explain as someone who should a do more yoga and b is western and has like very little connection with like you know traditional pathways of yoga I mean, it's hard to learn yoga from a book, but <laughs> that's what we're doing. Um, I've just found that it makes more sense. And when we talk about like energy medicine, the same is true. Like why would a certain part of my body hurt when something in my psychic response or psychic um, mental, world, mental space hurts? Mental yeah, world. yeah. Yeah. I think if we, some people would say like, oh, it hurts because like, you know, you have you have this blockage and the body is trying to tell you that. But I think it's less of like the Venn diagram. It's less of like a telephone. It's not like the spirit calls up the body and is like, guess what? You now have like canker sores because I have, you know, some kind of spiritual tradition or spiritual condition. Instead, it's like two circles overlapping, right? Yeah. So a circle within a circle. Yeah. Um, instead of something being like a hierarchy right right like uh just top down up down yeah, yeah 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 i think that's interesting and that leads me to my question for you where does the body end in my feet no i'm just kidding exactly where does the body end? like is it is it really just the material physical only because like there's the auric body right i don't think it aura? is and i think rudolf steiner has that is that my, a misnomer oh really yeah because steiner was the first to identify at least as far as i'm aware there may have been other people working in like what became anthroposophy before him that had this point okay but steiner was the first i've ever heard to articulate it which was so i'll credit him which was that a the heart is not a pump the heart is not a mechanical mm -hmm. pump that moves blood and blood is not actually like blood is spirit to Steiner. Like mm -hmm. the, as soon as you draw blood and remove it from the body and analyze it or, you know, donate it to someone else, it's no longer blood. If you cut yourself and you're bleeding, what comes out is not blood. That is the chemical parts of the body that are useful. It's like the hard physical matter, okay. but in the veins, in there the blood. There are blood cells in it. Right. There's something more, um, something more potent and something more spiritual sure. contained within. And I kind of see like it's, I don't necessarily know where I would put the aura. I could consider the aura energetic and part of the body. I believe the aura mm -hmm. is probably produced by the body. Like think about it. If you're a hard materialist, think about it like bioluminescence and fish. A smell. A smell. A smelly smell. A big fart. 
Um, I think that well, the aura everyone has their particular right. character. My goodness. A I know. A the aura, I think that can, would affect the aura. <laughs> can radiate outward from the body as if it's emitted. Um yeah. oh well that's the other thing about the heart. Doesn't mm-hmm. it have it, it emits um electric well it emits electric uh, bioelectrical signals but why and so also it like feel? yes and Maybe also when you look at like organ transplant cases there are so many people who get like a heart transplant and then in these uh case studies their personalities change their you know memories sometimes even change they might pick up new hobbies that the donor of the heart had and a lot of these new developments are not purely the result of having like a traumatic surgery like a heart transplant like that's a big deal if you're having a heart transplant generally speaking that is because there is like you know something that's gone majorly wrong uh, and you have a confrontation with mortality all of that that certainly can account for some of the personality shift but it doesn't account for you taking on the personality or the interests yeah. of the donor yeah. right so there's something really when we look historically too about that. yeah and when we look historically too for most of human history um people thought that the heart was like the seat of consciousness and not the brain that the idea that the brain is the the central computer that tells your body what to do and where your soul is and all of that is relatively new in comparison with like Mm -hmm. what the quote unquote ancients believed about where consciousness resides. So I kind of think that the body Mm -hmm. as an external is pretty easy to define. Like that's kind of the end of the body. Maybe there's aura here that can like move out, but the aura doesn't have any physical impact. I think where it gets harder to decide where the body ends is when we move literally internally inside the body. Okay. Because I have no idea what's happening in there. (laughs) <laughs> like, well, you do kind of but yeah. i can't say for sure like there's this classic there's this classic story what that if you could though what okay if you could say for sure i mean then what well i mean then it, the conversation's it, over it, right it, like then you know in in the well <laughs> it, it's part of the conversation it's re- the receiving of the message and maybe it's not like oh this uh tendon this ligament this specific well that's what thing. i'm saying is is a little out of whack but you would know there's there's something disconnected in this area Mm -hmm. or there's something like my lungs aren't working the way they should right well but you're talking about i'm talking about sensation and deeper function of those organs so like why is it when people for example people who survive having a heart attack a lot of people who have a heart attack that's not a that's not the result of like a known heart failure like they've been living for years and knowing that it's harder to walk up steps and all that but just like one day have a massive heart attack for seemingly no reason at all in the survivor cases most of them seem to point to people knowing something's off but not knowing what and being like there's something wrong with me something is wrong i am there's something wrong with me today i'm not feeling well but it's not like i really feel sick And when you talk with cardiologists, they talk about like impending feelings of doom being sometimes a sign of like incoming cardiac arrest or something like that. Okay. But that's not associated with pain or heartburn or anything like that. It's just like, oh my God, something's wrong, right? Mm -hmm. That's what I'm talking about. It's like, what is in there? What is deeper? What is the connection between the subconscious or the conscious mind saying, hey, something's wrong but then also no physical symptoms that would be like, oh, and the something that's wrong is my heart, right? Like, to me, that's the question of how deep does that go and what is in there? And those lines become blurry. Yeah, I think it becomes harder to find the shared language Mm -hmm. and expressing what the issue is. Yes. And how detailed do you need to get in order to fix that? Yeah. But I was coming from like a perspective of reading the Greening the Paranormal and a few essays have mentioned this idea that humans had more knowledge in different areas that we no longer use or need. So one example is telepathy. Yeah. And there are some, there's at least one essay in there that spoke of an indigenous tribe 
somewhere in the world and I'm quite forgetting the area right now mm -hmm. but they seem to be able to know exactly where a, a predator was without seeing it mm -hmm. um, because they felt a certain sensation and once again it was in the body and well, that's not quite telepathy but there's another example and I won't go into that well there's something about that too in um really? yeah in animistic I think in Gordon White's book he talks about uh, again, people indigenous to New Zealand okay. and Australia and the ways in which they had a they had a very complex relationship with land and spirit management. And these things were all kind of the same, like land and spirit management was social management, was health management, was body management. Okay. But the because things, the interconnectedness between Yes. And the months. things that they knew don't it's one of those weird things of like this supposedly primitive ancient culture, the things they knew are things we're just kind of rediscovering now. And we're saying like, how did they know this? Like how would someone yes. living on one side of Australia know to plant this certain plant, which has a, a direct impact with like rainfall and water retention that affects the other side of Australia, right? Mm. Or migratory bird patterns that these individuals don't have helicopters or satellites or tracking beacons. We're kind of now just beginning to figure out like where butterflies go when they migrate and why that is. And we still don't quite know how they know to get there. Yeah. Yet those peoples were very aware of it. And not only were aware of it, we're facilitating it. Gordon's point was that this is essentially Helping telepathic and psychic. It's a marriage, really? a holistic marriage of literally mind, body, and spirit. And I like internally and externally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I wouldn't normally think of it as like psychic knowledge. No. But more of like a, a relationship between, well, between yourself and the world around you, the environment around you. But I suppose, I mean, you could consider it like spiritual, communicating with the spirits mm -hmm. of land um, just by the fact that you're paying attention to it as well. I'm thinking mm -hmm. about the difference here between like a uh, naturalist yeah. and uh, people who are indigenous mm -hmm. and how that connects in how we apprehend things about our environment, understand things about mm -hmm. our environment. So you, that's an interesting perspective. Yeah. But I... the whole like idea there was that like humans have, were had, some of us have now, but like had certain skills and abilities that we no longer do because they're no longer needed for us. I, I can just, just call agree my with mom. that though. Like you do. I do because I think it's still very much needed. I think the things that well, have that's not changed. The conclusion of sure the essay. I think the things that have changed are the emphasis we place on it in and maybe this is what you mean by needed the emphasis we place on it for survival and for our own emotional well-being yeah like, like they've atrophied like a muscle you don't yes use. that's that's exactly the word that i was looking for right okay it's telepathic <laughs> connected no i do try to i do try to send you telepathic messages mm -hmm. and i tried to send you one yesterday did you know what i sent you <laughs> what did you send me well, you have to guess um I don't know. Yesterday was a wild day. It was that it was in the evening. That you were hungry. No. Geez. I was starving. He's always thinking that I'm hungry and it's almost <laughs> always correct. Yes. Um, no, I was sending a gratitude. Ah. Well, thank you. And I sent it to Isabel. So Isabel. Isabel, if you're watching. I know you will. Isabel is our co-facilitator at the School of Occult Arts. And um, our friend. And our friend. And our numinous co-host. Host. So yeah. yeah. Which and Isabel think? is probably one of the people who's like, what are they talking about? They Somatics, I know what this is. She's screaming at the screen right now. No. And we're just just riding roughshod right over, right over that definition. Send us some resources. Yeah. It'll be good. I mean, it will be good to read them, but this is one of those things where no, it gets I'm back not. to like, how much time do you have to dedicate to these things? Well, and we did a lecture uh like two years ago <laughs> on physical magic mm -hmm. basically so we did um check out some resources there in the kind of body relationship yes 
Um, but there's so many places to to go with that. So much beyond um, that. Oh gosh. Well, it's that popular uh, psychologist talking about trauma being stored in. Oh body. yeah, the body keeps the score. Body keeps the score. Yep. Yes. So it's it's even more than that, and it's been innovated um, upon at this point. So check it out if you're interested. Um, pretty interesting. Um, I would say Barbara Carlson is also a good okay. person to check out. I think uh, she is aware of the importance of getting embodied, getting mm -hmm. in your body. Sure. Um, but yeah, we, we do know a few things about it. And it's something that we think about and, and practice. Well, the, again, this is the, the language framing. This is like when... I, when we talk about these things, we're using a lens that works best for us. And like not all technology is created equal. Like certainly not all language is created equal. However, I do think the underlying points of some of these pieces is just framing. Like Joe Dispenza, Dr. Joe Dispenza is a great example of this. His books are rooted in a kind of like pseudo computer science intellectual scientism mysticism and he uses a language of like you know quantum theory and the cell like the macrocellular level or microcellular level and like a lot of stuff that in my opinion comes across as sounding like kind of techno babble but the reason it works for his audience is because they are hyper tuned into that type of terminology and conversation. However, Joe Dispenza and I can have the same conversation about the same things if I'm looking towards, you know, something like something like the Tree of Life by Israel Regardi or the Philosopher's Stone or um I would even think Wilhelm Reich has some of the same kind of ideas. Anthroposophy has some of the same kind of ideas but they use different language to help different people plug into it as a source. And yes, that's a very chaos magic approach, but I do There's... think that that is 90% of the time differences in communication around locus of action is just to enhance belief so that the ritual works. Even if you're not calling it a ritual and you're calling it like quantum healing, like Deepak Chakra. That really goes back to the AI thing, too, right? Because he had this like digital this Deepak. Digital Deepak. I wonder how that. <laughs> Maybe digital Deepak replaced real Deepak. I mean that. Like a Black Mirror episode. <laughs> nothing can replace. No. Uh, but sometimes we do need more of some spiritual teachers and yeah and, and thought leaders. Well, I think that there's. That's my hot take. No, it's not. I, hot it's not. I agree with it. No. And like, I would rather, I know a lot of people get down on like certain like spiritual leaders or gurus or these types of thinkers. And yes, there can be like deeply problematic, you know, spiritual leaders and healers and all of that. However, I do think more often than not, mm -hmm. the reason we get down on them is because we don't understand the language they're using and we don't understand why it resonates for other people so when someone talks about like um when someone talks about consciousness survival in a hyper rationalist materialist frame i tend to tune out i'm like i don't really i don't really care about this however when someone talks about it in like a um spiritualist connotation or in a um cosmic consciousness kind of orientation i'm like yes this is great i love this i want to hear more about it but as soon as that turns into like the star seeds i'm again just immediately cold that does nothing for so me you've just siphoned yourself into a specific well yes and i think part of the reason why for me at least is because it has cultural signifiers and overlaps that makes sense to the culture in which I was raised. Like Western occultism has a strong kind of pseudo-Christian, pseudo-Judaic kind of 
pseudo Islamic undertone. Oh so it uses all of these like, you know, monotheistic kind so of pieces. Out of the Abrahamic religion. Right. It uses all of that kind of, you know, terminology that I grew up with in church, but huh. then reframes it to like teach a greater spiritual message. I don't know if like, if I was raised by like, you know, if my parents were like in a UFO cult growing up, would I be more interested in the star seeds? Probably. Yeah. Right. But like, is the, is the core of those messages the same? No, but they sometimes can be, and they sometimes have huge overlap. So I'm just saying all that to say, I'm like not really down thinking no, no, on no. those people well, even if it, i'm like star seeds are bunk and dumb is it kind of like mu musical preference like for whatever reason you don't happen to like certain genre sure versus another i mean there's it's a little bit it's not just aesthetics right like it's not just oh i don't like i like poetry but i don't like rap right like it's that go into and contribute to aesthetics right but there's like it's deeper than surface there was this and it's unfair to Kendrick Lamar. I think he's great. And Whoa. To Pimp a Butterfly is a great record. But there were a lot of like very middle class, never engaged with rap music before kind of like white kids who love Kendrick, Kendrick Lamar. And part of the reason of that is maybe aesthetic in that it's, oh, this is poetry and I understand it as such, mm -hmm. where maybe I don't understand like drill or gangster rap as poetry um that's that i think is kind of the difference right between the um is this just like aesthetic is this overlap they all have something similar and i just don't like the style like music because there's a truth component that music music doesn't have a truth component in that way like there's a spiritual seeking component to working the tree of life or working um the headless right or doing any kind of like long-term magical working right but you you were talking about like spiritual teachers mm -hmm. uh using specific language oh yeah to appeal to people who understand that who come from that background but also who understand when someone's talking to them mm -hmm. they understand that they're either talking to them and their group yes. or not yes and that yeah in that case i agree 100 percent because that's like someone being like okay I don't like the Beatles, but I really like the Stones. Okay. It's like, well, they're two rock and roll bands from Britain that are both doing rhythm and blues and precious, precious psychedelia oh from God. a British perspective. Okay. So what it comes down to at that level is like the Rolling Stones are just more, um, more dirty, right? They're more like, they're closer on the spectrum to the Velvet Underground than the Beatles are. The Beatles are more like, their packaging is more like oh god this is such a stretch yeah, this is rough. but their packaging is more like ceremonial magic yeah right? oh no like no, we're doing, we're, we're, doing um, we're doing um we're doing like that flight of the concord sketch this where they take lsd for someone i don't know who probably we know we know one person one who person's is more, loving us <laughs> i know who it is and it's it's not I just me um i love the velvet underground they're great I really like them. Yeah. Okay. But but moving on mm -hmm. to back to our conversation around um, mind body, I think. Okay. Yeah. But also like understanding and having a relationship with your body and that dialogue. I think it does open open you to having conversations with spirit. It does. And sometimes they feel a little bit similar. Is that possible? Because because you are. Yes. You're right? listening. Because you are in spirit. You are a spirit too. That's uh, true. So that's like astral projection. Me. Right? Oh my gosh. Like astral projection is when the spirit or the consciousness or whatever you want to call it leaves the body and goes somewhere else. Right. And there are. Intentionally. Yes. And there are spiritualist teachers and spiritualist traditions where the idea of the dream landscape and the astral are like kissing cousins or very <laughs> closely related. Right. And the, I remember, I forget who, it was a, a spirit guide 
unique to the spiritualist tradition. Okay. So a, a disincarnate spirit guide, an ascended master, if we want to use Blavatskian language, comes okay. down and sure. says, hey, when you're dreaming, you're talking with spirits. And the spirits that are talking to you, some of them don't actually like talking to you in the spirit, in the dream, in the astral realm, because you might wake up and then you just like flop out of the conversation. Like imagine how annoying that is. Peace. Right. And you're out. Oh. If that's true, that says something very unique about no the mind-body connection, right? Okay. Like, because then that would say that there's a hard spirit divide. Now, of course, spiritualism in the U.S. is informed by that same kind of neoplatonic idea. Yeah. But, but it's and unique also, that spirits are saying that and mirroring that. As translated by Blavatsky, too. Yes. She is credited to bringing that to the West yes. in a big way. From mostly Eastern influences, of course. Um, and yep. it's, it's incredible as an aside, just how much Western magic is really just uh, an influx of Eastern thought developed by Western thinkers. Like it's very out of the box in that way, insofar as it's someone from outside of a cultural mm -hmm. construct trying to, and I think in many cases, including Blavatsky's, trying to be for their time period, very, very um, respectful and very encouraging slash promoting of these traditions they found in Eastern, um, in Eastern cultures. Yeah, there's absolutely a sincerity there. There's deep sincerity, but then it's also kind of like jailbroken. So it's out of your, right. it's, it's really what attracts me to magic and the kind of like that type of magic specifically is it's Western and Eastern thought processes being like kind of kind of disassembled and then mashed back together. And I like that. I mm -hmm. think it's really, I think it gives a unique perspective that is outside of those two perspectives as they would stand traditionally. Maybe not as in depth in certain cases, maybe not as correct, well, but certainly no. as certainly interesting as a consciousness experiment yes because when we're when uh this knowledge was being translated and made accessible mm -hmm. to people in the west there is an idea of i think there is an idea of preservation but it's not the same no. because we are trying then ourselves to integrate it into ourselves yes. and thus things shift and change and it's not about perfectly preserving a an ideology, a philosophy, a religion, but it is about, you know, adaptation and allowing that tradition to grow. That's the real like kind of kernel in right? a culture. And maybe that's the teachable moment or the thing to walk away from <laughs> when, we, yeah, when we talk about magic is that magic should always be growing and evolving. Like we're doing, it's an right. art and a science. So we're always seeking to make it more effective. We're always seeking to understand it more thoroughly. It needs to grow. It can't be stagnant. Well, that's and there's nice. no, exactly. But like, there is no stagnation. To there cannot be, right. there's no perfect, pure uh, one thing right. that it has to be. It's always been changing. So Which that's when we talk about like conservation, it is. When we talk about AI too, as like this promised land of one day you'll, if you're rich enough, upload your consciousness to a computer and survive forever with your brain in a vat. That is the thing that magic is actually trying to avoid. Like we're not preserving, we can't, we've given up. And that's the, the interesting kind of development in current like Western futurism is this idea that we've given up the preservation of the body because back in the pulps and back in like the 1900s, there's this real kind of conversation about like, you take the magic pill, it's science. You're going to take this irradiated pill and you'll live forever. You'll never age. And somewhere along the way, we totally abandoned that. And we're like, yeah, that's, that's not it. The immortalist, movement. the immortalist movement is pretty, I mean, two of the leaders of the immortalist movement are dead now. So, you know, there's... Stop saying that. We, you need to support them because it's very interesting. It is. It certainly is an interesting and somebody's story. somebody's got to try but to be immortal, We've right? Can't always be the top 1%. I mean, I think... I mean, we all try in our own way. We do. To be immortal. But we've moved into this space of 
like remember in the 90s when we were growing up yeah. and first there was cloning they cloned those two yes. sheep and everybody was like cloning we're gonna have clones yes. and we're gonna live forever I do. and then everyone so quickly realized how ethically thrive ethically fraud that was then it turned into cryotherapy and do you remember all the news stories about like you can freeze yourself and in yeah. the future they'll thaw you out and i experienced cryotherapy <laughs> you you froze yourself and they I, thawed you out i froze a wart okay. <laughs> and it hurt it's not like it's walt disney's painful. head under disney world though like that's what i'm talking no about. but i did think about that yeah. when i was getting that done <laughs> Uh, Vanilla Sky is the movie uh, starring Tom Cruise about cryotherapy and lucid dreaming. Why have we not? We did oh, watch we it. Did we did we like it. I enjoyed it. I looking back. I didn't like that. It's worth a watch. No. It's worth a watch if you are new to all of this. If you have no idea, like what astral projection, lucid dreaming, consciousness preservation, life extension, any of those things are, that's a good movie to like dip your toe in. But it kind of it it's aged dumb. poorly. I, I didn't like the okay. ending. I mean, no, the ending's not great, but just watch the ending. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I say watch all that Live to Die say, Repeat. Live Die Repeat's maybe a little better. Also, Tom Cruise. I liked that. No, I know. I was thinking Minority Report, Live Die Repeat. And this is another an interesting sci-fi. Well, he has to do interesting <laughs> sci. He has to do interesting well, sci-fi yeah. because of Scientology, shame. right? Like Scientology, I know. Okay. They will. Scientology is a kind of like yes, there's the land scheme component and the human trafficking Watch and it. all that stuff. <laughs> I like it, it's it's no. bad. It's no everybody knows. Stuff. There's an HBO documentary everybody's seen. Going clear. It's worth a watch. Um, That's however, it grew out of occultism. I mean, L. Ron Hubbard was part of, he was one of Crowley's students. So exactly, there are occult themes there, but because Hubbard was a, pop, a pulp sci-fi writer, you see all of that really 1930s pulp sci-fi, like just mashed into magical systems. And that's kind of what the, the, the early kind of gestation of Scientology looks like from just a, like a historical perspective. Um, nothing, I guess, for, for people who practice that, like more power to you as long as you're not hurting people. Um, I say all that to say, though, mm -hmm. we've kind of moved beyond that now. Like we are no longer doing the body can survive forever. So okay. now we're just doing my brain can the survive, mind. the consciousness can survive. And in this static form, in this form of you change, but you remain on the material plane. It's not a more developed spiritual approach of losing the body and leaving the body behind like transcending ego right similar is well it's that the part of it's maybe alchemy like the body serves a purpose to get you so far and then the body stops and the mind goes on and does something else and i or the consciousness or the spirit or whatever you want to call right. it but it doesn't do it here anymore in the same way it's not observable in the same way it's not like I can just go over to my computer and click like run Dan Eckhart brain file. And all of a sudden here I am unchanging and unchangeable. Yes. Well, I was thinking more um, the desire behind the preservation of self was transcendence. Mm -hmm. So transcending the ego and then eventually yeah. returning to cosmic consciousness. I'm blending a bunch of. <laughs> worldviews we're seeing your um, world view start death. to uh, peek no, through here oh no, no i i am speaking um about mm -hmm. uh golden dawn and mm -hmm. um other cultures as well yeah golden dawn is not a culture but no but other systems of magic and other thoughts about what happens after we leave yes, here and like the ideal but i feel like that's the different than the ideal of just preserving a personality yes there's no sense of ascending or transforming mm -hmm. there's just being and continuing being and continuing in the physical forever like i because for people who are and i will just like name names here Whoa. for people who are materialist like die hard and like that's their philosophy for like someone like elon musk there is no afterlife or future like and maybe that's the best outcome for Elon Musk, like that there is no afterlife or future because God, like God help him. However, his uh, his best bet for transcending death 
is to stay firmly rooted on the physical plane, like in something like Dune, and experience just like brain in a vat life. <laughs> God Emperor. God Emperor Musk. How... <laughs> Sandworm Musk. Yeah. But there's there is something. I think of him more though, like kind of funny. I think of him more like in the book like the Machine Crusade, where the Titans oh. just have like brains in a vat that like stride around. Because even the God Emperor, this is the deep dune I have lore. Just hold its base. Deep dune lore for all you real heads. Um, the God Emperor is a transformational process of consciousness and body. So that's kind of more like god emperor would literally be more like the work of the golden dawn where you know xerxes in the machine crusade is more like the work His of name Elon was Musk. Xerxes? Like yeah those the, books are bad like the historic yes brian herbert wrote a bad book and it was all of the dune prequels we'll just read just read, just the, read frank, the stuff by frank herbert yeah if you haven't if you have if you're this a... is your reminder to read rehab's game yeah. if you're a magician if you're an occultist specifically because occultism is generally so informed by eastern philosophy and western religious like input dune is so good at that because it's just a futuristic extrap extrapolation of those blended models where all abrahamic faiths are kind of subsumed into one faith system Ben Gesserit. Yeah, the Orange Catholic Bible. Yes. Like I I love that because Herbert had such a keen eye for similarities and also evolution over multiple thousands of years of beliefs, which is something you see when you read like Manly P. Hall and the secret teachings of all ages. Yeah. It's like, oh, Mithras, Jesus, like these things just evolve for thousands of years and become yeah. new things. And it's not just evolved. Of no, course, no, no, no. They reincarnate complex. in many ways, right? Oh, I love that. They they become what they need to be for the time. I love that. I like that too. That's like the thing I want to sit with forever. It's like Is that what will be as well? I hope so. Like I think it's the you know, we when we talk with again, calling out our friend Isabel, who has a great uh series coming out on building grimoires. If you're interested in like starting to create your own grimoire, go check out Isabel's work. She's uh, a master of bullet journaling and all of that. Isabel Rizzo. Yes. Uh, we'll link to her website, I'm sure. Yeah, we should. She has this conversation that, you know, well, we have this conversation with her about time as a flat circle, but it's like a spiral. And we're always kind of in the same space historically, just moving through different levels of the spiral. And so... I wonder if like... DNA like the yeah the like, like yeah because I always think of it as a funnel like going mm -hmm. down and then I think am I going down or am I going up right and I don't think it's quite I don't think it's clear that. like I think because of because of the way we chart time we think things happen in the deep past or they happen in the distant future and then there's the present which is of course very carol very much like shadow time that sort of thing but hmm. I don't think that they're in any way linear like if we were to extrapolate time, like if we could take that double helix of time and iron it flat, I don't think it would be like there were the ancient Greeks and then there were the Romans. And it might be like there was America and then there was like <laughs> 2070 China and then there was the ancient Romans and then there was... <laughs> right. Or in yeah. America where there was only America. <laughs> right. So I think like... I, I see. I kind of see these things as... So it's it's like a repeating cloudless. pattern. Yes. So watch That's Cloud your Atlas. other movie, your other occult film wreck, Cloud Atlas. Also, tiny bit controversial, but we, Excellent. the spirit of it, the we spirit, think is really wonderful. You know, and of all the kinds of people working in Hollywood who, who choose to tell stories mm -hmm. that maybe they don't have a place telling, mm -hmm. I'm thinking here of like almost any Mel Gibson movie. Okay. <laughs> um, the Wach Wachowskis, Wachowskis, however you say their last name, the Wachowski si siblings, they are probably the most equipped to tell a story like Cloud Atlas because they're asking those same questions about identity and lived experience and reincarnation. And they're not just like paying it lip service is like, you know, yeah. not to be like too identitarian here, but just like, oh, this is the thing that we should do, but we're all just like, you know, normal cis hetero white people. Like they are 
individuals who are in a process of sincerity i do think of them in film in the same way that you can look at blavatsky i was just thinking oh i'm seeing parallels here problematic sometimes but honestly so which is different than being like providing we have a value we have a money making thing to make you know yes yes yes, which is always a process in something like hollywood where multi-million dollar films need to serve some kind of financial interest so, so intentions do matter. They do. We I cannot think... talk about it, but I'm also thinking now Avatar, The Way of Water just came out. Yes. And I think Avatar is also sincere. Also, also good, I think. Yes. I liked Avatar, The Way of Water a lot. And maybe we should do a film episode. And then watch can. Arrival. Honestly, I would say yeah. Arrival and Cloud Atlas are the two to really watch. We need a list. We we need to do a film we'll, episode. We'll make a list and, um, and we'll do... I guess that would be super fun. I'd love to talk with you about that. So let's let's do an occult next film time list. Do like we'd have to put it. We'd have to do a horror one. We have to do a sci-fi one. Horror, right. sci-fi, straight up occult film. I'm thinking Yodorovsky. He's um, Holy Mountain is like the stereo. It's not stereotypical, but I think it's like the final word on occult okay. Golden Dawn film. <laughs> like... Okay, we have to we have to book end this right Mm -hmm. now because otherwise we're going to get way off track and that's a great idea for a future episode so we will do that probably will do that next episode yeah because we really are interested in that gives us an excuse to watch movies too as if we needed more (laughs) um but what were we talking about Uh, other than science fiction right um i think these are the questions though when we talk about the body that are super useful to be asking, which is what can the body teach me as a spiritual teacher, not just as like, what's wrong with you? Yeah, it's not also just knowledge about you. It's knowledge about the world, Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, which is interesting. And once again, the body is a a being that experiences time in a way that we experience time, Mm -hmm. but also in a different way (laughs) (laughs) because the body does degrade and change in a very physical material way. But it also receives and conveys information out of time. It does. And the body... Which is very curious. And talking about things like heart intelligence. I love... Fascinating. It is. And one of the things that I love so much about like dream space with the body yeah. is how, how clear it is in dream space or on entheogens that the mm-hmm. body... The consciousness doesn't know what to make of the body. Like when you look at your face in a mirror in a dream, yeah. it's shifting and changing constantly. And when you think about like your face, yeah. it's shifting and changing constantly. It does. Like I don't look like I did two years ago. I don't look like I did when I was in high school. Like I think people look at me and because of the illusion of time say, I know who Dan is. That's Dan. I recognize him. But if you were to remove that illusion of linear time, you wouldn't be able to point like you or me out as who we are if someone just saw us on the street could ai no because <laughs> ai can't do hands so <laughs> all you'd have to do to fool ai is just do hands. Me now, ai <laughs> yeah i gotta be done now i know but <laughs> that is the um that's i, I think that's now. that's really interesting to me is like on some consciousness level on some spiritual level we know the body is ever morphing and ever shifting And I've gotten into a space Mm -hmm. with, I'm excited to try this with entheogens, but I've gotten into a space with this on dreaming where people always like tell you in dreams, like, don't look in the mirror, don't look in the mirror in your dreams. It's really freaky. It is freaky because, because it is ego, um, it dissolves the ego in a weird way. Are you always yourself in in your dream? You're not. You're not always yourself in your dream, I was right? truly a Louis Trefer <laughs> last night. Because <laughs> you've been watching a little bit of Veep and Seinfeld. Yeah, awesome. she's cool. Um, I think it's because we're not comfortable with ego dissolution. Mm-hmm. And I think I've never had like really bad trips with any kind of entheogen. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure I will at some point. Yeah. But one of the framing devices for people who are like, exploring the realm of like psychonaut uh, kind of consciousness exploration is to reframe the trip the bad trip as Mm. it's only bad if you resist it if you see it as something that you deny Mm. but if you look at it as a way like oh i feel really shitty about myself 
because I'm not achieving my goals or whatever. Sometimes I find this with, um, I find this with certain substances. Sometimes you feel like, oh, I was really crappy to that person and I didn't realize it. Mm -hmm. Or, oh, you know, I was really, um, I did this thing two years ago and it's coming up fresh in my mind. It's like that wasn't operating in alignment with like what is right relation. If you resist that and you're like, oh, this freaks me out. It quickly turns into a denial process, which quickly turns into, I'm a bad person. There are people are going to get me. They're going to hate me. Everybody despises me. And that is resistance. As soon as you flip that to, oh no, actually I did do maybe something I shouldn't have. And next time I'll do something different. I found that that experience is far easier yeah. to handle. So there's a level the of- The same is true for dream. Okay. Yeah. So there's a level of openness and- allowing the experience to be a teacher yeah even if the teacher is scared yeah because it's life or again right or, or saying things that you'd rather not accept and you do feel threatened mm -hmm. um in in receiving messages of any kind really yeah. not just spiritual or in dream space or things like that there people often do feel threatened it's very natural but we need to allow ourselves to be open to the teaching to shifting in ourselves well, it's because we cling so hard to that illusion of the self, of like the self is just one thing. I mean, it's a perspective. Yeah. It's, I don't think of it as an illusion, but it is a perspective. I think that there's something illusory about trying. I understand what you're saying, and I agree with it writ large. Sure. I just think there's an added level of nuance of specifically in Western materialist culture. We're always looking for the smallest definable part. Like, yeah, the what atom. is the, what is the atom? What is the quark? What is the, yeah. the smallest possible thing, the smallest possible essence, right? And we play that same game with our consciousness. We do that a lot. I see it a lot in Christianity of people being like, well, it doesn't really matter what happens to my body because that's all the soul. I'm just my soul. Mm -hmm. You see that seep into new ageism a lot too. I don't think there is a smallest well, definable part. I think some, we a lot are. Of Christianity comes from other traditions as oh, well definitely. including more pagan i'm talking more evangelical christianity here of like you a know a special breed a special breed <laughs> god love them of like oh my and you hear it a lot in like sympathy where people are like they're in a better place after someone dies yeah. and as a medium i think yes they're in a there's a different place but the they is the key word here because they are multitudinous and they are maybe not exactly the way we remember them. And we see that in mediumship a lot. Sometimes a spirit takes on an exact like feeling and replica and um, appearance of the person who passed. And sometimes they're living a different experience. Sometimes they show up as how they would have preferred to be remembered. Or sometimes they show up as, you know, an expansion or an iteration on an idea. Yeah. I think we get very uncomfortable with the idea that we are not static individuals who are always getting quote unquote better, but instead we are many things. It's, yes. And it's kind of like when as a child, you first realize that your parents are people. Ooh, yeah. Instead of just being mom and dad. Instead of being people. deities. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, yeah. Yeah. In, in a way. In a way. Um, Do you think our cats have ever had that realization that we're not deities? Do you think the cats know. worship us? I don't they think so. don't if they're if they do they're doing a very bad job i think psyche is an iconoclast she's like martin luther she's in there being like listen hermes we have to overthrow them they are corrupt <laughs> oh, she's got the 95 dc <laughs> yeah well oh gosh we're not doing that play on not words okay so we started <laughs> off, we started out with cats we are ending on cats we are um, thanks so much for joining us today next time we're going to do the occult books uh, no the occult movies. movie list uh, there's going to be some real weird ones. Comment below if you uh, have an occult movie or a movie that is occult adjacent or a movie that you think speaks to the occult, even if it's not occult proper, to um, that you'd like us to watch and maybe talk about or that you think we should be aware of. Yeah. And next week, we'll show you our recommendations in Inner Sanctum. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks. See you next week. Bye. Bye.